last week we uh, looked at verses 1 all the way down through verse 6. Today we'll look at verses 7 to 13. And if you have found that in your Bible, Mark 6, would you stand? And we'll read verse 7 to verse 13. Now the Bible says uh, in Timothy, that Paul instructs Timothy to give attendance to reading. And some might think, oh, okay, yeah, pastors should be reading the Bible. What's interesting is he's actually talking about give attendance to public reading of the Scriptures. Because, you know, for us, it's as simple as purchasing a bound, printed copy of the Word of God. But in those early days, everything was, what? It was hand-copied. And the Scriptures, they didn't have a completed Word as we do. And so it was necessary for uh, the, the pastor to make sure to read the Word of God to the people and for people uh, to, to memorize and, to, and try to remember what they could from the Word. So the public reading of Scripture is still a big deal, right? It's not something to just kind of be, oh, okay, yeah, this is part of our ritual. No, it's because uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So... Mark 6, verse 7, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey save a staff only. No scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide, till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out devils and anointed with oil many, that were sick and healed them. Father, I thank you for the scriptures. I pray that you would uh, give unto us the understanding, Lord, and the application. Change us, affect us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When it comes to what a church is and what a church does, there's a lot of uh, times uh, in our mind's eye, we think about church as primarily a place of teaching, or maybe a church is a place of comfort, but a church is also to be a place of training. Within a church, training is something that is supposed to take place. When it comes to the introduction of, of colleges and places of giant air quotes, higher learning, okay, giant air quotes, places of higher learning, sometimes we feel like we have to, de- we've, we've, the church is, is a place where people get saved and learn some stuff, but we send people elsewhere in order for them to be trained when it comes to things of ministry. But the church is a place of training. It's a place of training. You know, the Apostle Paul, before he was saved, He went by the name Saul, and Saul was a man who sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was the most prominent Bible teacher of his day. The disciples sat at the feet of who? Jesus, okay? But the disciples didn't just sit at the feet of Jesus. Jesus spent time training them. So our thought for today, or what we're going to try to dig at and walk away with, is this, is that a virtuous believer, because our theme this year is virtue, just do right, okay? So a virtuous believer is somebody who is more than teachable, he or she is trainable. There is a difference. The Bible will use the word teach, but in the eye of God, or in the mind of God, if you will, Teaching is more than just imparting information one way. It is expecting someone to hear and to do. 
right? In James, and during prayer time this morning, uh, as Aaron was praying, he brought that scripture uh, up in his prayer, and I was reminded that we are commanded in James not to just be hearers, but to be what? Doers. When you think about teaching, teaching really is imparting knowledge in a one-way fashion, okay? Teaching is imparting knowledge in a one-way fashion, but training is teaching a skill or a behavior through regular practice and instruction. And training is two-way. Teaching is one way, but training is two-way. Now we understand the Bible speaks to teaching and commands us to teach, but we have to understand that teaching in the scriptures is more akin to our modern understanding of training. And here's, here's why. I think because there's so much information available to us in the world, and we have this notion that we can learn anything, or we can know anything, that we've heaped to ourselves knowledge, but we've lost the element of doing something with that knowledge. Okay? Um, if you ever watch Jeopardy, we think those people are so smart. Okay? With all due respect and having never had a conversation with a contestant on Jeopardy, what is true is that they know a lot of facts. They have a lot of knowledge. But then their ability to take that knowledge and do something with it, we don't really know. We don't really know. When it comes to church, when we think about coming to church to hear the word of God, we want to be taught, we want to learn, but we have to understand that it doesn't, God doesn't intend for you to just learn information. He intends you to receive truth that you may do something with it. And we see that Jesus trained his disciples. So four points this morning, very, very simple. Number one, the disciples are sent to do a job. This is what training looks like. They've, they've heard the parables. They've asked questions about the parables. So they understand the parables. They know who Jesus is. They know what message uh, he declares. They know why he's here. And now they're sent to do a job. And the primary objective of that job is preaching. All right, let's, can we just think, can we use our imagination? What, where do you suppose Peter took speech class? Did he ever have a speech class? Okay. Where do you suppose Matthew learned to form an outline and then deliver a presentation uh, on a screen? Did Matthew learn how to do that? No, but these men had sat at the feet of Jesus. They had learned from him and they were willing to be trained. They were willing to do what Jesus asked them to do. In Luke chapter 9, the end of the passage, there's these three different men who say to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And then Jesus gives them an instruction. Well, you know, um, or Jesus will invite them to follow him and they'll have excuses why they can't. Okay, So if, if they have excuses why they can't, that tells us they're not really interested in being trained. But then when it comes to Matthew, Matthew is sitting at the receipt of custom. You know what he's doing? He's doing his job. Sitting at his desk, doing his nine to five, and Jesus says, follow me. And what did he do? He got up and he left. Because he wanted to be trained. He wanted not just to be taught of Jesus, but he wanted to be trained. So the disciples are sent to do a job. Preaching is the primary goal. Mark, Luke chapter 9 is the parallel passage to Mark 6. And Luke 9, 2 says, And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God. That's the primary objective. Preach the gospel is how Luke frames it. And then number two, the disciples, having been sent to do a job, are equipped for the work. So how did Jesus train? Well, 
We see number one, they're sent in pairs. All right, so Jesus gives them a job. He sends them in pairs in Mark chapter 6. The Bible says in verse 7, He called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two. Now, all right, what's more, twelve or six? Numerically, we would say twelve is more. We say, why would Jesus send them in pairs if he could have sent them individually and they would have got things done in twice the time? Well, because the Bible reveals that when it comes to doing things, Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9 says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. You know, right now when it comes to Bible memory in our church, within that little group, we've got over 30 people uh, who are signed up, okay? So if without some organization and some accountability and working together, are more verses going to get memorized by 30 individuals doing it all on their own or by 30 individuals within a group who are working together? Right? And so Jesus understood two are better than one. And why are two better than one? Because they have a good reward for their labor. So he sends them out by two. There's certainly accountability in that. There's safety in that. In uh, Matthew 10, which is another time when Jesus sends his disciples out, he says to his disciples, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So it wasn't just, you know, not everybody was excited that the disciples were coming to preach about Jesus. Not everybody was going to be pleased to hear the message. And so they're sent in pairs And though the primary objective is preaching, they are empowered to do miracles. Why are they empowered to do miracles? I heard it because the Jews require a sign. Right? Here's why God has not empowered me or any of us to miraculously heal all of our ailments. Because the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. God works in Jews through signs. You can see from the very beginning, from the very beginning of as a people, he worked in them through signs. And because he knew that Gentiles seek after wisdom, Greeks seek after wisdom, he gave us the written word to study. Right? That's how we, that is how our faith is grown. And so the miracles are given to the disciples so that when they go preach to the lost sheep of Israel through signs and wonders, what they are preaching is shown to be true. They may place their faith and trust in God because of the signs. Number three, the disciples are prepared appropriately for the work, for the job. So Jesus uh, not only sends them in pairs, he, and he, he enables them to, to do these miracles, to help the preaching uh, be received as truly the word of God. He also prepares them. Notice that they are, they're not to take, they're to take what they need and not what they don't. Verse number eight. Of Mark 6, it says he commanded them and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey save a staff only. If, if um, I, that's how I think when we go on road trips, right? <laughs> nothing save a staff only. When you look at other passages, right? I, I would say this. This is how me and my wife think. We are minimalist in traveling. And, and sometimes youngers think, we're going to need everything we have. Well, Jesus is very careful to say, nope, you're going to take one staff. What's interesting is that in the Luke and the Matthew accounts, he doesn't say take one staff. He says, don't take staves. Right? He says, don't. He's very specific. Don't even take two staffs. Just take one. Right? Just take one. All right. Anyway, I'm going to keep going because my mind goes to all kinds of places that people think we got to have this. Well, Jesus, in sending these guys out, said no staff or one staff, no script. A script, if you just do a simple word study, a script is a small bag. They had a small bag 
And then that in that small bag, they would keep, might call it their ditty bag, okay? They had a small bag, and then they're also told, uh, don't take any bread. Like, what are we going to eat, right? No money in your purse, but be shod with sandals, all right? What's that mean? Good pair of shoes. You're going to need one staff, a good pair of shoes, and you're going to need one coat, not two. So he is even clear as to what they need to take what they need and not what they don't. Interestingly enough, they're also instructed to stay in the first house that invites them in. In verse 10, he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house. Now, all right, again, you compare with other passages, Matthew and Luke, they're instructed to go into a house that will receive them. Okay, I don't know about you, but for the most part, I don't walk into somebody's house unannounced unless they what? Invite me in. Okay, so the disciples aren't just barging into a house. They're, they're going to go to a town for the purpose of preaching. And while they're there, they need a place to stay. And so Jesus says the first place that invites you in, you go there and you stay there. Isn't that interesting? It's like, why do you care where we stay? Why do you, why do you care? Like, why can't I? Why can't I upgrade with my hotel points? Well, this does kind of protect them from some things, right? This would avoid distractions. They stay at one place, and let's just, you know, imagination rolls a little bit. Someone comes along and who hears their preaching and says, Hey, you want to come over to our place? Stay our place for the night? I promise you the food's better. Okay? Distractions start to form, and attachments that they're not supposed to have can form. You stay in the first place that invites you in. Don't worry about a nicer place. So some people, right, could invite them to come stay at their place with good intentions and that be a distraction. But conversely, there's others that could invite them to their place and they have uh, bad reasons for doing that. In other words, this would prevent the disciples from being misled. So don't worry about a nicer place, but don't waste time being in the wrong place. They're there, they're there for a singular purpose. Stay in the first place that you go into that welcomes you in. Don't waste time with the frills. Focus on the job. They're also instructed how to deal with those that reject their preaching. The Bible says that in verse number 10, or verse 11 rather, Whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. So we think about this, you know, uh, every culture has gestures or demonstrations that invite judgment on the person to whom that gesture is shown. Gesture is shown. You follow? All right. When we grew up uh, living in... Um, Just outside of Augusta and Chelsea, my dad worked in Augusta. All of our grocery shopping and errands were in Augusta. And um, the rotaries, right? You either love them or you hate them. I think they're great because I don't have to stop at a stoplight. But if you used a rotary in a way, the rotary in a way in which a person was not pleased with how you used it, you could get what we understood to be the Augusta salute. All of us adults understand what the Augusta salute is. It's a gesture that invites judgment. Now, it's wrong, okay? But understand that this gesture of taking off their shoes and slapping them together for the dust to fall off, every Jew understood that they were inviting God's judgment on them. That's what's going on. And so if they go into a city, they preach the gospel, and people run them off, Before they leave, they stop, they slap those sandals, the dust falls off, and every Jew knows, you're calling on God to judge us. And then Jesus goes on to explain, listen, it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Sodom and Gomorrah are going to fare better than those cities that reject you and your preaching. It's going to happen. You're going to get mocked. You're going to get math. In Matthew 10, he goes into all kinds of details. They're going to get hauled before councils. They're going to get thrown out of synagogues. If you walk through Matthew 10, you realize 
that Jesus is sending these guys out for more than just a weekend missionary journey. They're probably gone for months with all the things that are going to go on. So, so they're leaving the feet of Jesus to go out on their own to preach the gospel. And this is part of their training. They're to publicly denounce those Jews who reject their preaching. But then fourthly, and this is at the end, towards the end of uh, middle of the chapter, verse 30, next point, the disciples report on their work. Verse 30. A while back we talked about how the term disciples sometimes refers to the large crowd uh, that followed Jesus for his teaching. And sometimes the word disciples refers to the twelve. The word apostles is referring to those twelve disciples. So verse 30, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Now, again, like race back to that moment and just watch for a minute and think about what happened when those disciples relayed to Jesus the things that they did? They were opening themselves up for further training. We can be confident that when Peter reported, you know what I told them? Jesus may have said, you know a better way you could have said that? Or here's how I want you to teach that. Did the disciples have complete and perfect understanding of, of everything? No, sir. No, ma'am. Up until Jesus' crucifixion, they're still wrestling with this idea that he would even die. And so when they come back and they tell him everything that they did and everything that they taught and all that they said, you can be confident that that was a time, a teaching slash training time, where Jesus further instructed them. He further instructed them. There's an old saying that you ought to inspect what you expect. So the disciples, they're sent to do a job. They're equipped for the work. They're prepared for the work. And then they report on their work. They give all these details. Details, details, details. So let's take a step back. A virtuous believer is more than teachable. He is trainable. Jesus sent the 12 to do this work. He didn't send or didn't send the masses to do this work. Think about this. He didn't say to the 5,000, okay, I'm going to send you out to preach the gospel. He entrusted it to 12. There's another time when he sends out a group of 70 that he entrusts with a message to preach. And the difference between those disciples, those 12, and the masses was that the disciples had a steadfast mind to please the God who saved them. They were willing to obey. They were willing to be trained. Three ways in which a virtuous believer is more than teachable. He's trainable. Number one. A virtuous believer is trained to trust God's plan. He's trained or she's trained to trust God's plan. If God says it, then I'm going to trust and obey. Isn't it funny? That song is so true. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Matthew 10 and verse 24 Again, another account, you should look at it, where Jesus is giving all these instructions to the disciples. He says this to them. He says, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. So when we look at the things that Jesus did, I love, you know, remember a while back uh, when wristbands first became popular amongst Christians, there was the WWJD wristband, right? What would Jesus do? And it, we, we, we entertain the possibilities. What would he do in this situation? What would he do about that? And before we ever have to get to a place where we speculate, what would Jesus do? There's all kinds of what Jesus did do, examples 
for us to look at. Remember, the, probably one of the lowest things that Jesus ever did was he washed the feet of his disciples. Awful job. A job that was reserved for the lowest on the pecking order servant in the house. It was expected. It showed respect. But usually you gave that job to give that job to Jimmy and have him do it. Okay. And so when the disciples are gathered together to eat, Jesus does this. He washes their feet. And Peter wants none of it. But Jesus says, no, you need to you need to be trained in servant leadership. You know, sometimes uh, we're not trainable because we're above doing things. Like, we see who we are maybe in the secular world or who we are at our job or who we are amongst certain peers. And then when it comes to God wanting us to do something, we just assume it's just a well it's just an even jump you know if i'm a if i'm a ceo here then i ought to be a ceo in the church my i if i do this uh in my job here then i ought to be doing this at my job here but but that's not being trainable being trainable says being trainable means i'm not above doing anything that needs to be done as part of my preparation and service for the lord that's what that looks like we have to be trained to trust God's plan. And if God's plan is that we learn to serve and do well in little things, it's then we are able to grow into bigger things. We have to be trained also to trust God's enabling. Trust God's enabling. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating a blessing and instructive all at the same time to watch the kids sing. Uh, because it is an opportunity for us to worship and for us to praise the Lord, but also to reflect and to behold what's going on in their lives. You know, children, it's easy for us to see growth in children because the change is so dramatic, right? They grow three inches uh, in a year, and they start eating food like there's there's none, you know, like it's going out of style kind of thing, right? You see them grow. And so growth is easily, it's more visible to us in children. That ought to be an example to us and not just give us warm, fuzzy feelings. Because ultimately, in order for kids to sing or play the flute or for an adult to play an instrument or lead music or for an adult to do whatever it is there has to be training there has to be a willingness to be not just taught not just information to be relayed but for there to be practice and inspection and review and ready criticism Right? Constructive goals, changes. Like those things have to happen in any organization where it's a culture about where, where training is part of the culture. I remember when my dad's in the military, he's served for many, 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 many years, two tours overseas, and uh, served his country well in those. Things. And so when we've talked from time to time about developments within the military, I remember when there was discussion slash implementation. I don't know if they have it now, but there was a time when in boot camp, a, uh, someone in boot camp could have a stress card where if they were too stressed by the drill sergeant yelling at them, right, then they could pull out a stress card and they were given a length of time where they were given a break from being yelled at. Okay? Right. Right? It's not a good idea. We're playing a standish yesterday, and the boys, um, our, our school travels well. 
And it feels like every gym is our own home court. And so as the boys are cheering the girls on and people are staring at that corner because they've never heard cheering like that before, I can see from a coach's standpoint that it is disruptive to the girls' communication. And in my mind's eye, I'm thinking, boys, you got to cheer louder. Because come playoff time, there's going to be disruptions. And you got to figure out how to navigate through it. We came to a timeout during the boys' game. And, like, we're up by 30, okay? And they're missing layups that they ought not be missing. And so they're getting chided about missing layups. They should not be missing. And one of the players said, well, the cheerleaders on the baseline, and let me just explain to you, 10-year-old girls waving pom-poms going, go team, right? He's like, that's distracting. I said, you need to get over it and figure out how to make a layup with the distraction. This is part of training. No one's going to say, oh, shoot, really sorry about distracting you and your attempt to score points and bury our team even deeper. No. There has to be training. There has to be feedback. So a person who is, who is trainable, a disciple who is trainable, is going to trust God's enabling, that God will help me do what he told me to do, and they're not going to, and this is maybe, excuse, is just understand where I'm coming from, they're not going to wuss out or tap out because it's hard or pushes them beyond their comfort zone. You know, every, every believer, I am convinced, has this circle within which they are comfortable serving God. And so all that they will do for God is within this circle. And they're, they won't go to the edges. And you know when, and I'm going to get real transparent in a way that if I hurt your feelings, it's not because I'm wanting to hurt your feelings, but just think with me. When someone says that they're shy, it's more likely that they have a high view a higher view of themselves than they should have just think about that with me someone says i just i can't talk to people well of course you can of course you can talk to people you talk to the people you want to talk to right hello you talk to the people you want to talk to but the reality is that you don't want to talk to a subset of people for whatever reason, shape, form, whatever. That's like that's the fundamental issue. For digging at roots, it's not that you're you can't talk to people, you just don't want to. Okay? This is uncomfortable, isn't it? Oh, I can't. No, I can't. Uh, I can't serve the Lord by okay. I can't budget my money. Yes, you can. You just don't want to. You don't want to sit down and say no to yourself. For those, whatever it is, that, that guilty pleasure, that, that coffee, that snicker bar, that whatever it is that you get every day that you just don't want to give that up. I know I'm meddling now because I touched on coffee. But you just don't want to say no to yourself. You don't want to discipline yourself. Like, that's the reality. And when we get to those spots where I'm like, where we say, I'm not going to do this thing, that's where our trainability plummets for God. And so on the fringes of that circle, okay, on the fringe of that circle, where we start to begin uncomfortable, if we will push ourselves, then our circle of influence, our circle of capability, our skill set, our talents, abilities, for the, they begin to grow. They begin to grow. And it is a passion of your pastor that our church be a church with a training culture. I do not want to spend my days imparting information to you in a one-way fashion. But I will joyfully and have joyfully and will continually joyfully spend my days pushing you to get that circle bigger. Do a little more for the Lord. And so when I say to you or someone else says to you, hey, why don't you do this? Don't get your feathers ruffled. They're not trying to hurt you. They're trying to help you. First Thessalonians 5.24, right? The Bible says, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. 
So if God has called you to do something, and God has a will that's laid out clearly, okay? It's been touched on today uh, about the need to be a light. I just can't do that. No. It's that you don't want to do it. That I don't want to do it. I've got other things that are more important, more pressing to me right now. Uh, I just, okay. You can find people in the Bible who had excuses that sounded really, really good. But in the end, all they really were were excuses as to why I can't do what God's asked me to do. Trainable. A virtuous believer is trainable. Not only are they trained to trust God's enabling, they are trained to trust God's supply. Okay? If you're serving God and God has called you to do that thing, you will always have what you need. Always. God will make sure you will always have what you need. Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need. Okay? Very simple. All means, and that's, that means, right? So if the Bible says that my God shall supply all your need, if you don't have it, it may be that you don't need it. And if you need it, then you will have it. You're going to have it. Train to trust God's supply. Jesus taught many. Jesus taught thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I think it's fair. We we don't have it's not recorded in scripture, so it's not relevant. But I think it's fair to assume that Jesus preached to more people than any other preacher that's ever walked the planet. Thousands came. John says at the end of John's gospel that um, that if all the things that Jesus did were written down, the world itself could not contain the books. Okay, so we're given snapshots of Jesus' ministry that help us know what he did and what he taught and and who he was. But Jesus preached to thousands, but at the end of the day, how many did he train? A dozen. Twelve. Twelve. Probably because those were the only few in his day that had a steadfast mind to please the God who saved them. That's it. Those guys had virtue. They may not have had knowledge and everything figured out, but when Jesus said, here's what I want you to do, they did it. What about our church? Are there people at SLBC, by and large, are you a trainable person? All kinds of people want to hear stuff. They might even want to learn stuff. But some people, they don't want to be shown how something should be done or how something shouldn't be done. When we think about what the disciples were asked to do, they were sent to do a job. Are we doing our job? Are you doing your job? Well, what's my job? Well, to fulfill the will of God. Well, what's the will of God? Well, it's in your Bible. Well, how do I know that? You've got to read it. You have to have a heart to obey it. Are we doing our job? Are we equipped by taking the equipment? Think about this every time. A football player nowadays goes on a field. He's got more equipment now than they ever had, right? They've got like pads and helmet, all kinds of things, right? But they have to make a choice to put the equipment on. I can have, Jason and I can be working on a project and we have all the tools in our, at our disposal to correctly remove a piece of trim and not damage that piece of trim. But we could use the giant pry bar that's handy because it's quicker. Right? You have to make use of the tools that are given to you. Are we equipped by taking the equipment? Are we preparing ourselves for the work? 
one of the things that we're working to implement in our church is 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 discipleship okay and and it's it's you're trying to get a plane off the ground slowly but here's beginning with the end in mind if somebody were to come to our church hear the gospel and get saved then what how is it that we take that believer and help that believer grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and become a, a faithful follower of him to the glory of God. If there's not a plan, then nothing's going to happen. We might say, boy, just praise the Lord. I'm glad you're saved. Here's a Bible. See you next Sunday, which those are good things. But there has to be steps that get that believer to a place of growth. And here's the thing is this church or a church, that culture, that is not something that can only exist in a few people at the top. There has to be a whole congregation of people that understand that a babe in Christ needs to be cared for and needs to be tended to. If we understand that people need to hear the gospel so they might be saved, it does, our church is not going to flourish if there's one or two people that understand we need to reach people with the gospel. There has to be a whole church of people that not only believes that, but is passionate enough about that to do something with it. If it is important for us to play music skillfully, to sing skillfully with a loud Noise, as it says in Psalms, we're commanded to sing skillfully with a loud noise. Okay, two things you got to have them both because if you play skillfully but not a loud noise, people can't hear it. But if you play with a loud noise and not skillfully, nobody wants to hear it. The two have to be together. So, is there a culture in our church where the musicians are applying themselves with excellence and practice and discipline so that? On Sunday, when they play, oh, I want to see him, the heart of a saint is encouraged and edified, and they desire eternity. They desire to see the Lord because the musicians and the song leader, they did so skillfully and with a loud noise. You see what I'm getting at? Like, the magic doesn't just happen. There's training. When, when Jesse and Juliana said, sorry to call you out, but when they said that they were willing to work with the teens and teach the teens, what does that say? Trainable. Great. Let's work on this together. So here's what we didn't do. We didn't say, well, best of luck to you. Watch out for that Colburn kid, right? Do you know that we meet with them every Wednesday? an hour before church, an hour and 15 before church to help them or for them to help us to go through discipleship. Why? Because it doesn't just happen. Your kids, I think there's a verse, right? Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Part of that training is what? Instruction and correction. They need both. Together, right? Training, 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 training. It's got to be intentional. It's got to be a priority. It's got to be followed through. There's got to be inspection. And here is, here's the piece. Here's, here is the glue that holds it all together. In order for training to happen, there has to be within a person a willingness a willingness to be trained and in everything that's involved in that like a willingness to be corrected this is the part that's hardest for us as Americans and especially Mainers because we are always right and even when we're wrong we're right and we feel like sometimes if I admit that I'm wrong or if I even introduce the possibility into my mind that I'm wrong, it introduces feelings and vulnerabilities that I don't like. I don't like being wrong. But in order for that circle to expand, 
there has to be that initial, uh, this isn't right for me to not grow. It's not right for me to not listen to when someone's trying to help me. It's not right when someone's trying to instruct me. I, nobody likes it, but everybody needs it. Are you willing to apologize to a teenager when they're right? Are you willing to hear what a, a, a brother or sister in Christ has to say about your decision? If someone comes to you and says, I see what you're doing here, but here's something you might want to think about. Are you easily offended by that? Don't be. I see what the Lord did. And I see how successful Jesus was at turning the world upside down by a handful of guys. And I wonder, what could our church do if we had a whole congregation of people that are trainable? That aren't just wanting to know stuff so that their life is marginally better until heaven, but people who want to be trained to be their very best for God's glory alone. Can you imagine the places we would go and the things that we would see and what God would do if our whole church was filled with humble people who are trainable from, from the whole spectrum? Oh, that the Lord would give us hearts that would be trainable, willing to not just be given information, but opening our lives up to instruction to correction, to guidance from others who are seeking to help us. Lord, help us to be trainable. Lord, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you for your example as a, not just a teacher, but one who trained. Help us, Lord, to have trainable hearts before you. Lord, help our young people who, even though they may surpass us in their skills to serve you, Lord. Help them not to lose a trainable heart, a teachable heart. Help us, Lord, whether we're in a position of, of teaching or serving or cleaning or in, in welcoming guests or whatever it is, Lord, help us to stay trainable before you. Teach us your way, O oh Lord, help us to walk in your truth and unite our hearts to fear your name as the psalmist writes.